My assignment for today is to speak about the what, where, when, and why of international human rights, or in other words, the philosophical, historical, and political origins of human rights. In approaching this, I wish to also emphasize the importance of being attentive to critical voices, critical perspectives, what might be thought of as expressions of human rights skepticism. This is a big agenda for a short amount of time. Let's see what we can make of it. In beginning with the question of what, as in what are human rights, and when, which historical periods are we speaking about, I'd like to introduce an observation that perhaps is so obvious that we fail to even notice it, or at least to reflect on its full significance. Human rights today confront us in the form of international law. When we think and speak about human rights, we're thinking and speaking about standards of law. This doesn't go without saying. It wasn't always like that. Throughout history, human rights, or ideas similar to the contemporary notion of human rights, were articulated first and foremost as moral principles, moral norms, norms for how human beings should interact, treat one another, and how society should treat its members, in particular, those most vulnerable and in need of protection. One can find examples of this in most, if not all, cultural traditions of the world, in all great world religions. Religions, moreover, typically contain doctrines having to do with the nature of the human being, the sanctity of life, and in many cases, the dignity, the inherent dignity of the human person. Religions also are associated with ideas about the organization of society and what constitutes requirements of justice. At various points in history, human rights have been approached as philosophical ideas. In the Western tradition, one sees examples of this already in antiquity with notions of natural law and natural rights. These were in turn taken up in the Enlightenment era by thinkers like Locke, Rousseau and Kant, who linked the idea of natural rights with a social contract theory that in turn is often seen as a kind of precursor to the contemporary uh, human rights framework. At certain points in history, human rights have been articulated as political claims. This was a central theme in the French Revolution and the American Declaration of Independence where the focus primarily was on establishing the equality of all citizens before the law and a range of associated liberties. In the 19th century, a number of social movements have successfully established particular human rights claims. This is true of the anti-slavery movement, the movement for universal suffrage, labor rights movements, establishing uh, minimum wage provisions, minimum working hours, safe working conditions, and a variety of other uh, social and economic rights movements as well. When successful, claims of this nature have been taken up and enshrined in legislation at national level and sometimes even been protected by uh, constitutional law. These developments are all highly interesting and very relevant to our present topic. But, to use a slightly awkward phrase, one might think of them as pertaining to the prehistory of human rights. The history of human rights, in the contemporary sense, the standards of international law, begins around the middle of the 20th century. There are a few antecedents to this. Examples of ILO treaties, for example, establishing international uh, standards for labor rights protections. But by and large, it's a process that set in motion in the aftermath of the Second World War with the establishment of the United Nations and the adoption of the UN Charter. In 1946, a Commission on Human Rights was mandated to elaborate the reference to human rights in the UN Charter and on this basis draft a, a Universal Human Rights Treaty for adoption by the United Nations. Initially, this led to the presentation and adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, and following this, 
in the 1960s, 70s, 80s and into the uh, present millennium, a range of human rights treaties have been elaborated and adopted. Central of this are the two covenants from 1966, which together with the UDHR form the Universal Bill of Rights, but also a number of specialized treaties. There's a similar development and process at regional level in several regions of the world. This indeed is the exact focus of the present course, to develop a comprehension, understanding and perspective on the standards and mechanisms of human rights law in the United Nations framework and at regional level. Our question here is to reflect on what does it mean to pre present, to articulate human rights as principles of international law. In a structural sense, this generates obligations in two different directions. Human rights treaties establish obligations of the government vis-a-vis -vis the citizens of a given country or people inhabiting the territory. At the same time, a human rights treaty establishes obligations of any state party towards other states who are parties to the treaty, so intergovernmental obligations. This is the nature of uh, international law. And expanding from that, in a wider sense, the human rights legal framework establishes obligations of all states towards the international community at large. In this way, human rights standards emerge as core principles of international law, central focal point of international relations, and a focal point of politics of governance at national level. Human rights treaties establish the way in which a country is managed and run, not just as a domestic concern, but a concern in general for the international community. This is a principle that has gradually been articulated and accepted in the decades following the Second World War and has now reached a point of quite wide acceptance, even to the point of thinking of the protection of human rights as not just a legitimate concern, but also a responsibility for the international community. This is, of course, a contested idea or a contested principle that is sometimes met with uh, opposition by advocates of a stronger emphasis on national sovereignty. When the drive to articulate uh, an international legal framework um, centered around human rights law and human rights standards was launched uh, in the, in the mid-1940s, this was very closely associated with the idea of making a new beginning. The historian Marianne Glendon uh, gives a beautiful description of this in her, uh, in her book about the drafting and adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which with, has the evocative title, A World Made New. Um, there was a sense of common purpose. This captures a sense of common purpose, of rejuvenating the world, of building a new and better world uh, from the ashes of the war, from the ashes and destruction of the war. A similar sense or drive towards rejuvenation has characterized subsequent decades, in particular the 1960s, when, the, um, when newly liberated uh, nations, newly established nations, liberated after decades or centuries of colonialism, set in motion uh, a drive to create a just uh, and inclusive post-colonial world order. Um, similarly, in the 1990s, after the end of the Cold War, there was a general rediscovery of the importance of international human rights law as a means to tackle a range of problems of fundamental concern to an interdependent international community. In all of these cases, the reference to human rights is linked intrinsically with the idea of developing and, and establishing rule of law at um, international level. This is an idea, an aspiration, that was articulated philosophically as far back as the 18th century and is now in being put into practice. 
for better and for worse. In turning now to the question of why, why the idea of human rights has emerged as a common standard of achievement for all peoples and all nations, as is stated in the preamble to the Universal Declaration, and perhaps also the question of where, as in where do human rights principles come from? In approaching these questions, we will not be able to arrive at one definitive answer. But I'd like to introduce three or four different perspectives on the, on the central issues that may help us to think about and understand what's at stake, and also, perhaps, to understand where certain expressions of human rights skepticism are coming from. Before turning to this, I'd like to make one more important observation. The process of establishing an international human rights architecture uh, has, from the start, involved many different stakeholders and has been driven by a broad range of differently positioned actors. These include statesmen and women, diplomats, politicians, intellectuals, opinion leaders, but also ordinary people, people fighting for justice in the society and the in the settings in which they live, and social movements who've been reinforcing, protecting and supporting such claims. We've talked already about the way in which representatives of newly liberated former colonies played an important role in establishing the human rights agenda of the 1960s, and in particular establishing the principle of a right to self-determination as foundational to all other human rights. The civil rights movement um, became prominent and established a wide sense of um, opposition to discrimination, racial discrimination and unequal treatment in society. And the global feminist movement or women's rights movement similarly has established core principles about equal treatment and opposition to gender-based discrimination and violence. Social movements similarly have focused attention on the importance of children's rights, rights of persons living with disabilities, rights of migrant workers, similarly rights of indigenous people, just to make a few examples. In all of these cases, many stakeholders have come together, as we said, and different ideas, different aspirations have clashed and crystallized in the form of agreed new standards. The Commission on Human Rights, which met annually from the time of the formation of the United Nations until 2005, when it was replaced by the Human Rights Council, was a marketplace. A place where different people met and um, uh, where different actors met and, and argued and, and made claims and shared ideas and eventually reached certain um, points of agreement about a shared agenda and, and way forward in relation to human rights. The Vienna Conference on Human Rights uh, in 1993 similarly was a, an occasion for the international community, actors positioned at many, many different levels, to come together and set a joint agenda forward-looking for a new era. Um, the point I'm trying to emphasize is that human rights don't have one source of origin, one particular meaning. They're part of a dynamic process related to governance and international coexistence in the current era. Now, to turn to the question of why, as I said, I'd like to introduce three or four complementary perspectives. The first looks at the value base of human rights. One could say it has to do with the positive affirmation of certain values as shared by members uh, of different civilizations, different cultures, different religious traditions, and held to be central to um, all of humanity in the, in the contemporary era. Examples of this could be values having to do with justice, solidarity, compassion, equality, respect. But the heart of all of them, perhaps, lies a shared affirmation of the idea of the inherent dignity of the human person. What does this mean? This means 
that human beings deserve to be treated not just as a means for the ends of others, not just as an instrument or tool we can use for particular uh, other objectives, but as inherently valuable, as an end in one's own right. This is reflected in human rights standards having to do with the integrity of the human person, in particular the physical integrity of the human person, the prohibition against torture, ill-treatment, arbitrary imprisonment, or for that matter, arbitrary killing. It's also reflected in a broad range of freedoms, liberties, the freedom to think for oneself, form one's own opinions, and express one's ideas and opinions, the freedom to decide what kind of relationships one wants to form, association with others, political associations, choice of how one wants to um, live one's family life, for example. Also, um, freedoms to participate in the cultural and political affairs of the community and nation that one is part of, freedom of movement. All of these freedoms affirm the inherent dignity of the human person. Interestingly, one can also see a reflection on this in economic, social and cultural rights, which not often are linked uh, or not often thought about in the same way. Economic, social and cultural rights are fundamentally about empowering people, about empowering people to, be, to take charge of their own affairs, to take charge of their own life and be active participants in the society that surrounds them. This is true of the right, clearly, to education, for example, but also rights such as the right to health, the right to food and the right to work, the right to shelter. As we noted, Thoughts related to the inherent dignity of the human person can be found in one form or another in all great uh, cultural and religious traditions of the world. So they mark an important common focal point for the international human rights framework. That said, there are also points of contention. Sometimes the values enshrined in human rights are seen to be out of sync with the values of particular cultural or religious traditions. This is true, for example, in some cases, of concepts of what, the, what, what are the requirements of justice, related, for example, to ambiguities about the legitimacy of death penalty. Similarly, issues having to do with the role of religion in society, in the public sphere, and the alleged secularism of international human rights is sometimes linked with a, with a potential value conflict. Same is true of cultural norms defining gender relations, for example, in particular issues related to sexual orientation, and also the clash, the potential clash between the human rights framework and certain established cultural and traditional practices. All of this said, there's a clear sense, I think the glass is more half full than half empty, as it were, when it comes to articulating a common global value base, the human rights framework does capture some very important um, elements. Now, coming to the second perspective on the why and where uh, of international human rights, I'd like to introduce what could, by contrast to the positive affirmation of values, be thought of as a negative affirmation or a denunciation, a rejection of particular practices that are seen to be illegitimate, abusive, or inconsistent with human rights. As we have noted, the very articulation of human rights standards derives from, to a large extent at least, from the mobilization of people for particular causes in particular times and particular uh, political and social circumstances. This, as we've seen, was true of anti-slavery movements, labor movements, uh, civil rights movements, anti-apartheid movements, women's rights movements, and many, many others. In all of these examples, we see illustration of how human rights are a product or a legacy of struggle. The South African human rights expert, Christoph Heinz, once developed what he called 
a struggle theory of human rights and stated or suggested that every human rights as recognized in the international legal framework is the flip side of the coin of a fighting cause. This is a very appealing and evocative idea which in fact might help people differently positioned in different parts of the world to associate with and embrace the human rights framework, to feel its utility and relevance in their own circumstances and context. However, I don't think it's the full picture. In addition to the struggle that's uh, undertaken by particular groups, by people particularly affected, there's a need for their claims to resonate with society at large, to be taken up by opinion leaders and politicians or philosophers, civil society organizations, and packaged or established as core principles of how society should organize itself going forward. This indeed has happened in all of the examples, all of the cases that I've just mentioned. What we see here is how human rights are fundamentally embedded in his history. How human rights emerge from historical experience, and in particular from historical experience of something that constitutes a threshold, of something that is wrong and that has to be righted, looking forward. If one takes this idea or perspective and applies it not just to particular human rights claims, but to the human rights framework as such, one can see the human rights framework as the emergence of or one can see the human rights framework as a reaction to a comprehensive uh, situation of wrongs in the past, a com comprehensive societal uh, flaw, one might say. This is exactly how human rights were thought about uh, in the aftermath of the Second World War. The international community looked at the atrocities of the war looked at the way in which modern technologies and the organization of mass mobilization of, of armies and of, of people led to the destruction of human life, the violation of, of uh, and, the, and the destruction of property. Interestingly, this perspective on human rights as embedded in history, as emerging from historical experience, can be applied not just to particular rights, as we have done a moment ago, but also to the entire human rights framework. This is exactly what happened at the end of the Second World War. During and after the war, people looked with dismay at the way in which the most advanced technologies were used for destructive purposes, to slaughter and murder people on a mass scale, and to destroy property, to destroy societies. The Holocaust came to epitomize this. It was a systematic, deliberate genocide perpetrated by industrial means. It was seen as the quintessential violation and disregard for the dignity of the human person. And in response to this, the world said no. The world said, never again. We cannot allow this to repeat itself in the future. We cannot allow anything similar to occur in the future. How do we prevent this? How do we ensure this? We do it by making a historical break, by starting a new epoch. And that epoch is defined precisely by the values that, con that, that denounce, that contrast the wrongs that were perpetrated and prevalent in the, in the past. So, the confrontation with wrongs in the past becomes an affirmation of a new moral, social and legal order. And this is exactly what the International Human Rights Framework was intended to accomplish. One sees a similar way of approaching and relating to the past in the anti-apartheid uh, movement and in particular in the way in which the apartheid legacy was processed in South Africa after 1994. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission confronting wrongs in the past, denouncing them, and on that basis forging a new social, moral, and political order uh, 
that would be inclusive, respectful of all members of society, all races, all ethnic groups, and um, this is what we have come to think of as the rainbow nation. A processing of historical experience in this regard has been undertaken in the framework of transitional justice in many other parts of the world. It was done in Latin America in response to the experience of military dictatorships where nunca mas reports were intended to establish a platform for society to move forward, always premised on a shared affirmation of the inherent dignity of the human person and the wider legal framework centered around principles of human rights. In processing historical experience in this way, there's one particular question which I think we also need to raise, which is which histories, whose experience counts. In many ways, the human rights framework has been successful in reacting to the most egregious and atrocious um, wrongs in the past, but there may be particular groups that feel nevertheless disregarded, overlooked, not accorded sufficient attention. An important example of this is found in feminist criticisms of the international human rights framework articulated, let's say, uh, in the 1980s, 1990s, into the, into the new millennium. It has been held in this connection that the experience, that the subject of human rights is inherently gendered, inherently male. The experience of women and the experience in particular of abuse of women in society, in armed conflict and in a variety of, in the, in the domestic setting and uh, in, in communities in some regards, has not been accorded sufficient focus, emphasis and attention by the international human rights framework. This has been taken seriously and must be taken seriously and I think has in some regards also been, if not corrected, then at least ameliorated in subsequent developments, resolutions of the UN Security Council on Women, Peace and Security, for example, and in other regards. But nevertheless, there may be a way to go to ensure that the existing normative and legal framework is responsive to the way in which different groups are positioned in society in the current era. The same thing could be said uh, of descendants of slaves, and has been said, uh, or for that matter, um, uh, people inhabiting countries that were former colonies, and in that connection being exploited, oppressed and abused, with continuing effects uh, on society today. The World Conference in Durban in 2001 against racism, xenophobia, and other forms of intolerance and discrimination, certain groups try to um, establish the idea of reparations for wrongs perpetrated in the framework of colonialism as a central challenge for the international community. This is not just a matter of making economic um, compensations, reparations, it's also a matter of recognition of recognition of historical experience in a way that the, the existing international law framework is perceived to be responsive to the experience of people differently positioned in the contemporary world order. A final perspective in this connection may, may be linked with the persistence of poverty on a mass scale in many parts of the world today. Are there ways in which the international human rights framework is insufficiently responsive to a historical uh, legacy of, of affluence co-producing poverty? If that's the case, human rights again need to take the challenge on board and evolve in ways that react to, um, to, to these concerns. The third perspective on the question of why that I would like to introduce has to do with the intersections or the relations between human rights and other primary objectives of the international community. I'd like you to think first about the image of a triangle. When the United Nations was formed, 
it was clear from the outset that a primary objective had to do with ensuring peace and security in the world in the future. This, of course, is also manifest in the form of the UN Security Council, which is one of the most powerful and important organs of the entire organization. Another primary objective of the United Nations was to facilitate global prosperity. And this is linked with the idea of development, economic development and social development. Institutionally, this in turn is reflected in another primary body of the United Nations, the council called ECOSOC, the ECOSOC Council. Now, these two primary objectives, which we can put at the top two corners of the triangle, clearly inter interact in, in a positive way, potentially, with one another. The more we can ensure peace and security in the world, the more there's a chance for uh, societies and peoples to prosper, not to invest in destructive technologies, not to invest in warfare, rather to invest in, in production, development of society, development of people, development of the economy to the benefit of all. And conversely, a prosperous global economy, a prosperous world, is less likely to engage in hostility and armed conflict. So one can say that peace security on the one side, inclusive prosperity and development on the other side, or maybe one could say equitable economic development on the other side, enter into a synergistic relationship with one another. They mutually reinforce one another. The third angle of the triangle uh, should be associated with the notion of human rights. So from the outset, the international community felt that in order to develop a world order reinforcing peace, security, prosperity and development, one needed to also ensure protection of human rights as a common objective of the entire international community and of all member states. This is maybe slightly less obvious, but it was felt that totalitarian regimes were characterized precisely by the abuse of human rights and at the same time were a profoundly destabilizing factor in the international world order. So if human rights, and in a wider sense maybe democratic governance, could be ensured in member states, it was likely that the world order would be able to realize the aspiration of prosperity, peace and security. So, in the decades that have followed, it's been a central challenge for human rights advocates to demonstrate that there's synergies in all axes of the triangle, not only between peace and security and economic prosperity, but also between human rights and peace and security. So the more we protect human rights, the more we'll be able to maintain peaceful and secure societies, and the more we protect human rights, the more people will enjoy economic, and so, economic prosperity and social development. That's the core idea. This even comes to the point where the concepts of peace and security and development are being assimilated to the uh, human rights norm, to factoring in a human rights aspect, aspect, such that we think of security as human security and development as human development, not just economic development in, in measured in euros or dollars, but rather in development of people, of the capabilities of people, the ability to realize oneself and one's aspirations for a good life. Similarly, security, not just as a way for society to protect its border, to protect itself from external hostilities and transgressions, but for people in society to live fulfilling and secure lives in respect of their, human, of their inherent human rights. This is the objective, as we said, that, that is projected as the, a new beginning following the end of the Second World War and that has been revisited at crucial moments in the seven and a half decades that have followed. Now, if one visualizes this kind of triangle, one can also, in fact, 
see where certain expressions of human rights skepticism uh, enter into the picture. For example, in the relationship between uh, peace security and human rights, there are people who think these are not always compatible with one another, the relationship is not always synergistic. Sometimes it's argued you get more security by disregarding human rights standards. We associate this with the notion of securitization. There are, this, is, this is a phenomenon one sees in, in most if not all parts of the world. Certain transgressions of rights to privacy are being justified in the name of anti-terrorism, for example. Even harsh interrogation techniques, in fact torture, have been justified as ways of keeping uh, Western society secure, American society secure, in the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks on the uh, Twin Towers in New York. Um, there are many, many, many other examples of this kind of disjuncture between human rights and, and peace and security. And from the point of view of uh, the human rights champion, the human rights advocate, our challenge is to continue to show that one can attain as good or better uh, protection of social stability, peace and security by complying with human rights standards than by disregarding them. But that's a continuous challenge. It's the way in which it's a continuous work in progress to maintain the credibility and viability of the international human rights architecture. Same thing can be said exactly about the relationship between uh, economic prosperity and human rights. There are many good examples for how a human rights approach, a human rights based approach to development can be mobilized to enhance economic prosperity in parts of the world that have been seen to be underdeveloped or underprivileged. But there are continuously uh, political leaders entering into the picture who want to say no we can develop society more aggressively, we can develop the economy more aggressively by not worrying so much about certain labor rights, right to manifest dissent in the political sphere, freedom of expression, and all sorts of other nuisances that in fact hinder our ability to develop the economy. So we prioritize the economic development and then later we can start to worry about compliance with human rights standards. That's in blatant contradiction to the idea of a human rights based approach to development, but it's nevertheless a way of thinking that has quite some traction or credibility in many parts of the world, and that is especially um, uh, manifested in populist movements in, in, in many places, and that the human rights defenders need to take seriously and, and try to rise to always in concrete situation-specific manners. If we were to try to summarize these latter expressions of human rights skepticism in a nutshell, one could perhaps say that it's being suggested that human rights constitute a luxury that society cannot afford or cannot fully afford at the current moment in time. They have to be temporarily at least set aside in pursuit of other objectives which are seen to be overriding and, and, and more important. The response has to be to show, in one way or another, that society cannot afford to, to disregard human rights protection because it will steer society in, an, in the wrong direction uh, and ultimately undermine the, the, the overriding objectives. In conclusion of this short introduction, I'd like to introduce one last thought present one more perspective on international human rights. This is not about why rights are important, where they come from, or how they align with existing cultural and religious value systems. It's about how human rights are being operationalized, and in particular, how the reference to human rights positions different actors vis-a-vis -vis one another. I sometimes speak of this as a question of discursive positioning or implied status in human rights practice. We all know how irritating it can feel to encounter someone who seemingly knows it all and feels called upon to lecture everyone on what they ought to do, what is right and wrong in a given situation. This comes across as arrogant, condescending, disrespectful. 
human rights advocates stand in danger of being perceived in this way, precisely, perhaps, due to their fervent commitment to the underlying cause. Unintentionally, the reference to authoritative human rights standards may position the interlocutor in an inferior position as someone who is being lectured to, told what to do, or at least so it appears. This has been a characteristic problem, sometimes, in North-South interactions, where representatives of the Global South, typically underprivileged, sometimes subject to many historical human rights abuses, are now being told by their more affluent, comfortable, powerful counterparts from the North what they should do, in particular, with regard to improving their record of compliance with international human rights standards. Not only does this seem like a one-way communication, and in that sense as something a bit arrogant and condescending, it also seems as a matter of not respecting the other as capable of managing their own affairs. It's an unwelcome interference with the exercise of domestic sovereignty, and in that sense even may be perceived to be a continuation of the legacy of colonial rule now in a new colonial variation. Human rights normative framework is sometimes associated with this. We should be quite uncomfortable about that. One can point to a similar, somewhat similar dynamic at domestic level or between actors at domestic level, albeit in a somewhat different version. In European societies, we are witnessing a rising backlash against so called expert cultures. And, and Human rights experts are being associated with this, or human rights advocates are being associated with this. Elected politicians sometimes point to self-proclaimed human rights experts and, and ask, who are they? Who are they to tell us what, we, what is right and wrong, what we can and cannot do in the exercise of the mandate given to us by the people? Judges are sometimes accused of judicial overreach, interfering illegitimately with the political process. And it's even worse if the, the voice of the human rights advocate comes from outside the country itself, from representatives of institutions, international institutions, be it the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg or human rights bodies of the United Nations in Geneva and New York. This is seen to be an unwelcome, arrogant interference with the exercise of domestic affairs. Brexit is an example of where that could lead to when the frustration builds. It's my sense that many expressions of human rights skepticism, as introduced along the way, for example, the criticism that the human rights framework supports values that are out of sync with existing cultural values, or disagreements about how to align different social priorities. Such expressions of human rights skepticism usually contain, at a deeper level, also a frustration with this kind of question of discursive positioning, of how human rights are being in invoked and where that positions actors vis-a-vis -vis one another. The frustration with being talked down to. This is a complex problem with no simple solution or answer. As a minimum, we need to recognize it and keep it in mind. We need to remind ourselves that human rights essentially are about empowerment, inclusiveness, giving voice to others even when we don't fully agree. In advancing the human rights agenda in the contemporary era, it's essential from time to time to reconnect with the underlying impetus, to revisit the sources and origins of international human rights and rediscover a sense of common purpose. In a world of increasing polarization, divisions, inequality, this is as important as ever.